MK, the reason I wanted to talk to you is you've redefined what we used to call the modern data stack into a full application platform. It's not just about analytics. Why don't you tell us what team you're responsible for at Salesforce, and then let's give us an example of how, of what type of application um, you can build on, on this platform, why it's different from what we're used to. Wonderful. First of all, really great to meet you, George. Uh, I'm Murli Dhar Krishna Prasad. I go by MK for short. Uh, I'm the EVP for engineering at Salesforce. I've been here about five and a half years or so, and I run all of our uh, modern data, AI, both predictive, generative, uh, all of the automation and integration that's Flow, MuleSoft, as well as Tableau, uh, our analytics stack as well, uh, from an engineering perspective. Uh, I think you brought up a really good question, right? Like what have we done to sort of the data stack and what have we differentiated? I've been a long data person starting my career back at Oracle, working with uh, then SQL Server and Microsoft in many, many places. Uh, data is a very important ingredient to everything, whether you're doing AI, whether you're doing analytics, whether you're doing sort of automation and everything else, data is like the heart of it. One of the things we set out to do is how to make all that data actionable and usable by all the business users. Because half the time the thing we heard from a lot of our customers is they spend a lot of time building a lot of data platforms and others, but the business side doesn't quite see the value of it because they remain trapped in all of the warehouses or lake houses or other kind of places. It's really, really hard to get that of use, which is why you saw sort of, if you see a few several years ago, the rise of a lot of these CDPs where marketers said, hey, I want to sort of grab, grab all that data, copy it and make it my own so that I can do whatever I need to do. So what we set out to do is to really bridge the gap and create a platform and a technology where we are sort of blending the data side of it, which uh, like, how do you bring data? How do you harmonize and all that? along with the application stack so that you can use it in your line of work, be it a salesperson who might want to look at all their prospects or a service engineer who might want to look at all the knowledge articles and other things that might be happening so that you can resolve your service cases faster or your marketers. So you can actually go look at all your data, create segments, activate uh, and do all of the engagement with your customers and also your analytics people so that you can actually start looking at all of that data and do an analysis. More so with the advent of generative AI, we also want to make sure all of this data and the insights you're generating can now be used to be able to personalize your experience with either your with your employees or with your end customers as well through uh, the power of all the generative AI stack as well. So that's really what we have sort of set out to do. So we didn't go build a data platform for sort of for data platform stake, but we look at it as a really a business uh, integrated sort of data platform uh, for helping all our customers and employees. So just to be clear that it's not just about analytics, it's about crossing that canyon between the data platforms that just have done analytics traditionally and connecting that to operational outcomes. In other words, this is now a full application platform. That is correct, because to me, analytics is, is like an end exhaust. Analytics is very important to know how your business is doing, but you also want to be able to make all that data and insights actionable. So, so that's kind of our big thing to make sure we can blend all three together, AI, automation, and analytics, right? And so that's really what we have built. And to do that, it's really important that also you bring the metadata layer. I think that's the big secret sauce that we brought together because typically data is all about your tables and rows and columns kind of thing, but you also want that business semantic on top of it. You want to know it's a customer, it's an account, they are linked together, and that's this is how, how the relationship goes. That lets us build all of these layers on top, whether we're doing segmentation, whether we're doing co-pilot that says, hey, what's my latest opportunity I should go look at, or what, what should I do today when a salesperson wants to ask that question? to be able to break it down, know what's going on with the data uh, stack so that you can actually do the right answers. Okay. So all of that is sort of what we have done. I'm jumping in a bit, but let me, just as you've up-leveled the modern data stack, let me up-level before we unpack the technology, give us like one or two use cases that show that have shown how you could uh, customers can light up the platform and and not just the analytics, but where they're extending it into the operational activities. 
Yeah, I can give you a lot of examples. Um, maybe I'll start with Salesforce itself. Uh, Salesforce itself leverage, leverages our sort of technology. Uh, what we, for example, thought in salesforce.com, we had like over 200 million visitors. Turned out once we actually implemented our data cloud technology, we really understood that it was really 90 million people. They just had different sort of emails and names, et cetera. So we were able to unify it. But that also unlocked a lot of interesting things because we knew that people who clicked on certain web pages or people who actually watch uh, some of these trailhead modules would go buy certain things, right? That correlation we started analyzing. So what started off as a marketing stack where we said, okay, let's go do advertising, let's go do campaign management. We evolved that to say, you know what? When your uh, high value account, when a person from belong to that account browses our website or watches some videos, we are now able to send an alert to the AE responsible for the account that says, you know, your prospect is actually browsing these and the conversion score is probably high. Maybe you should go talk to them about it, right? And so you're giving them that personalized thing. So when that salesperson talks to the customer, they actually have a context that the customer really was interested in X, Y, Z. They don't go talk some random product, right? Or the other way where we look at all the products that somebody might have purchased, they don't even know they have it, or maybe they're not using enough. And then we can go nudge them to say, you know what, you have these things, can you go use them? And so that's just one simple example. And we have numerous customer examples. Uh, we publicly talked about a lot of them. Uh, for example, Interbanco is a great example. They're a digital LATAM banking customer who had very sort of poor engagement uh, with their customers. And within a matter of weeks, what they did was they instrumented all the web mobile traffic. They were able to create a simple insight on our platform that said who clicked on what pages and how many times. And their theory was if somebody was interested in a home mortgage, for example, right? They would be sort of clicking around all the mortgage pages. Somebody who bought a new car, they may be clicking around the car pages. And so they tried to then do a engage, like a personalized campaign. They got 35X ROI on their investment. Imagine that, right? Uh, or for example, Heathrow uses all our data platform to create that single view of the customer. And they're able to use both our Einstein sort of layer on top to be able to uh, improve your service response or even figure out uh, where should they sort of redirect uh, a plane to which gate so that they can maximize the experience that the that the sort of the passengers on the plane would have based on their purchases based on their propensity to do uh, so that the overall experience in an airport gets better like a completely different scenario or a third one I would add is Turtle Bay it's a resort it's a very high-end luxury resort and they implemented data cloud to be able to get that 360 view of what their customers are doing, their activities and all that stuff. And they use a simple all our Einstein models to be able to score to kind of even recommend what activity should they recommend to their guests. The interesting aspect of this is it really took their service hospitality business to the next level because they were able to predict, they were able to go sort of help their customers. So much so customers who usually in these luxury resorts, you tend to be anonymous. You don't want to really know. You don't want to give all your information. When they saw the experience that they were getting, they all wanted to kind of be part of it. They all wanted to actually share more information so that they can get uh, sort of much more sort of personalized response. So I gave you sort of different examples from advertising, marketing, sales, service, and overall customer experience. And that's really what's possible with the technology we have. And we have numerous more stories. Uh, and and ju just to round out that, just um, to be clear, you're not just operationalizing um, insights into Salesforce as the operational activity, as the operational ap application, but I assume through the connectors, this works with other, many other Absolutely. applications. Absolutely. Absolutely. So every environment we go into any IT department or any business is heterogeneous, right? It's not always just going to be Salesforce. So one of our big teams has been open and extensible. Salesforce from the start has been all around it, but we took it even to the next level. Uh, we can interoperate at the file level with warehouses and others. So when you hear the term data sharing, we created a whole thing around zero copy alliance as well. So we can actually freely share data between warehouses, lake houses, and other things. And in many cases, we can do it at even the file system level with Snowflakes, BigQuery, Redshift, and many more. And then we also have an open API at the SQL level so that we have a full-blown, fully JDBC compatible driver. You can use it pretty much in any JDBC compatible system, including uh, other analytical systems. Uh, of course, we have Tableau. Uh, you could use Power BI, Looker, et cetera. 
And then the next level, we also have uh, the uh, web APIs and REST APIs and webhooks and others so that we can actually call into those. Of course, using our connectors, you can connect to all of those systems as well. But that's just not that the data stack. Even at the ML stack, we made sure like uh, whether you can use our Einstein or if you want to use Databricks, you want to use Vertex, you want to use SageMaker, you can do so. You don't need to copy any data. You can literally point the tool, create the models, and then score any data in there. And then the same level, we took it to the LLM as well. It's not just the built-in LLMs. You can also bring in your own LLMs as well into sort of our stack. So overall, at the data level, from file to APIs to JDBC to APIs, at the model level, predictive and generative, we're trying to be open. Okay. All right. So let's unpack. Let's let's unpack the stack layer by layer fr from the bottom. I mean, you've given us a preview. So um, just to orient people who might be wondering, how did you accomplish all this? You know, where the incumbents are are still you know building out their their data platforms. So you've built on on Trino, the federated open source query engine, and and Spark for data processing. And explain maybe how how that's then a foundation you can assume, and then you up level from there. Yeah, great question. So first of all, we're built on in, in, internally we call it the hyperforce layer, which is the layer that allows us to run on a cloud substrate. And then at the storage stack, uh, we basically allow you. First of all, what we allow you to do is to we have lots of connectors built in or through MuleSoft, you can bring in any data. We bring in real time, we bring in streaming, we bring in batch. But with our zero copy sort of network, we can also leave the data where it is, could be in Snowflake or BigQuery or Redshift, and we can just point to it and just the metadata with us, right? Now, if you're bringing data into our system, we store them in Parquet format, and the table format we do is Iceberg. So we work with the Iceberg community, we are regular contributors back, and we've also worked together to enhance Iceberg to be able to support all these streaming function modes and everything else. Now, with the sort of the iceberg layer on top of it, to do the data processing, we use a combination of many techniques. Uh, we are sort of a multimodal platform. Uh, Spark is one of our big engines for us to be able to do streaming as well as batch processing at scale. Uh, for it, interactive queries, we use Trino for sort of large scale. We also use this thing called a hyper engine you might have heard about. Uh, it's the in-memory OLAP engine we use in Tableau. If all the Tableau experience you see is that like fast experience, same engine runs within Data Cloud to be able to give that interactive experience. So you can have both the, uh, if you're doing Tableau or other data exploration, you want that sub-second uh, response time. So we do that, uh, as well as we can scale to like billions of rows as well. Um, so we automatically do all of those internally. And in addition, we also have this thing called data graphs we have created, which is Think of it as a combination of multiple things. Let, let's take uh, your example. Let's say, I want to know what George has done. What are the pro purchases you've done? What are the marketing materials you may have seen? And so on, so that you can you want to personalize somebody's uh, web page or mobile or whatever they do in the next activity. And that has to happen in sub-seconds. So we've also created a technique called data real-time data graphs, where we can collect all the stuff, like in a JSON format, be able to load it in memory, and then serve it in sub-seconds so our personalization layer can actually personalize that next response as you click on a web page. Uh, so these are all the things that we use as the foundational building blocks to be able to create it. But the key thing is that we have strived to do is at the user level of our platform, you don't have to worry about, OK, was it real time, streaming, batch, federated, everything. We've tried to sort of standardize it through our metadata so you can use the same tools on top without worrying about where that data is originating from. Okay, just so let me let me try and synthesize. So you've got all this data coming. You it might be batch ingest, it might be streaming, it might be real time. Right. And the metadata progressively um, ingests, harmonize, unifies right. into a metadata model for a customer 360. I mean, That's all right. those pages are metadata driven, but the ultimate. A uh, customer 360 metadata model is borrowed from Salesforce, and then you've added um, like a customer experience or journey um, set of semantics that might not have been in in the Salesforce app. That, in other words, that extends the 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 customer profile. Help me unpack that part. Yeah, great question. So obviously, it's a general purpose platform, meaning it can do more than customer. But for customers, we can do a lot more. What is it? So as your customer, let's take your example, right? 
Um, if you look at any enterprise system as an example, maybe you maybe looked at George G or George Gilbert or maybe misspelled and so on, or maybe different email addresses and other kind of things across your marketing, your sales and service system, if you go to any business. And so what we try to do is to make, first of all, easy to bring all that data together, like I said, through whatever means necessary. And then we can first harmonize it. Harmonize means you want to create a common schema because think about a simple thing, something as simple as a user we call it a contact in sales cloud. You might call it subscriber in marketing. It may be a profile in your web or commerce site, right? Schemas are vastly different across your enterprise. And so we allow you to normalize it, right? Think of them like views, right? Like we allow you to create that. And then on that normalized or harmonized schema, you still have a problem because like, like I said, you may maybe your names are misspelled or different IDs you may have across the system. We let you then unify. After that step, I know it's the same George that got an email from my business, opened it or didn't open it, had a service case, had a sales call, this, these things on the website or whatever else that your business may be doing. And so that's that 360 view we have created. And then we let you create insights on top of it, which could be your LTV score or, hey, the propensity for what you want to buy and so on and so forth. And then we are letting you act on it. The action surface is very interesting. Now, if it's a Salesforce action surface, as an example, if it's a marketing uh, surface, then we let you go create segments. We let you go activate into ad tech platforms like Google, Facebook, and others. Or we may let send you on a customer journey. So we have the full journey canvas where you can create long-standing campaigns to be able to say, you know what, George, send them an email. If he doesn't respond, maybe WhatsApp or whatever else it is. And then we also feed that insights back so we can create close that loop. But it's not just about marketing uh, ad tech because it's a continuum, right? So then. That same person might then come on your website. Then you want to personalize that experience. And the same 360 will now give you that same website experience. And now from a website, you might want to proceed for your salesperson to be able to go act on it. What we are able to do is then create a flow so that you can now trigger an action to your salesperson saying, you know, George visited your website. He's a high propensity buyer. Maybe you should go talk to that, talk to George. And that salesperson can now look up, open up the contact page they will get that rich view about what you have done with the business. And then if they want to send you an email as an example, then we can bring the generative co-pilot assistance to be able to then say, here's a rich email you can send it that's totally personalized because we know all about you and then be able to send it. And now once they purchase the product or they maybe you have an online offering with our commerce uh, engine, then we can personalize that uh, experience, order buying experience, give you the right discounts. And then post that, if you do service, again, the same 360 view is available. So that service agent uh, can know exactly what you purchase, what you're unhappy about, and then solve the problem for you. And then of course, you can then look at all of this data in sort of, uh, in, in sort of as it is happening in things like Tableau, so that you can now analyze, you can create pulse around it, really know what's going on with your whole business, right? So that is really what is possible today with what we have built. So th uh, this is, this has become the, the first level application sort of extension customization configuration um, platform for the Salesforce operational apps. But just again, to reiterate, it's um, you can drive um, activity in non-Salesforce apps, whether it's the ad Absolutely. Apps, anything, anything that you can access to the transactional connectors that either you ship with or that you can extend with with MuleSoft, the extended family of connectors. That's correct. So there is both sides. On the data ingress side, like I said, either you can use all the connectors we have, MuleSoft, or with a zero copy, plug in into existing warehouses, lake houses. On the actioning side, uh, we have all those layers. Again, either the uh, if you're using warehouses, lake houses, you can just read our data without copies, or you can uh, plug in into our outbound sort of actions frameworks to be able to action into whatever surfaces that they may have. Uh, so we sort of have sort of both sides of the spectrum. Oh, so, all right. So let me just make, uh, let me clarify. Are the connectors both ingest, uh, like e, uh, ingress and egress? Ingress and egress, correct. Are they, are they transactional? Uh, when you say transactional, no. So, the in, so what these connectors do is to bring data in, right? Uh, and then oh, as they move, yeah, or are they action out, which could be events. Uh, I'll give a good example. Like uh, I'll give a simple example for say Ford is a good example, right? Yeah. Like as Ford, um, when you turn on or turn off your marquee vehicles, it sends an events to us. 
but that event only has the driver, uh, sorry, it only has a vehicle information. Uh, but what we are able to do is then append that unified profile information to it. And then they can trigger an email. For example, if you have crossed, I don't know, 100,000 or 10,000 miles on your Maki car, it can send a personalized email to you saying congrats. And that whole loop has to occur in a matter of minutes, right? Because the moment you start your car, you want to get an email or a, or a alert that says, hey, congrats, you've crossed this. That's awesome. Uh, and imagine the possibilities of such a system, right? You can now expand that to do servicing. OK, if the system detects something wrong with your car, maybe your tires are getting worn out brakes or whatever, it can now start alerting back. And that's now extending it to the automotive sort of domain, where we're able to now uh, looking at partnering with many uh, automotive companies on doing in-dash experiences and so on. So where we are now blending, this is why I said we are blending analytics and actions together. And if you take an example like an automotive, we don't we don't go run Salesforce uh, on the dash, right? It's like whatever the automotive car experience is, we're able to connect to those two. Uh, it's not just that. We're able to connect to uh, any of your existing investments you may have in your web layers. Uh, maybe you're using Adobe. Maybe you're using some other content management system, we can go connect to it. Um, we connect to Power Apps, Power BI, as an example. We connect to LookML, we can connect to Vertex. So pretty much we, both on the data sort of, sort of how to bring data in or to be able to action, we can easily connect to your existing enterprise environment, your existing applications. So, all right, so just to be clear, then when you're actioning, are you going through the same connectors that were responsible for extracting or ingesting the data or is that a, a separate no it will probably be different because when we are extracting or ingesting data they tend to be bulk ingest for the most part right or streaming ingest as the case may be when you're actioning usually it can be an api call to be able to action it could be a trigger it could be an alert so they can they they could be the same but not necessarily the same All right so so that's kind of what it is like send an email is not something you will ingest right send email is like an action as an example okay so the so the actions the actions will be sort of covering a, a separate surface area of these uh, um application api that's that's good and, and they, it, there can be there can be an update statement too that's okay but in most parts if it's an application scenario there are different kinds of actions one action is for instance showing a 360 view like your salesperson comes up and they want to see that 360 view that's kind of like an action, but basically what it is, it's a query underneath the covers, right? But they're going to go create that view. A second kind of actions is a actual an event that could go trigger some change. It could be an update to a row, possible, or it could be a trigger to go send an email, right? Or it could be a trigger to, uh, to go click, kick off some workflow or integration or some other action downstream, right? Like a power flow in, in the Microsoft parlance. That's all possible as well. Or an action could even be a lower level thing, like a query that somebody's firing from their warehouse or other kind of things. So all of that stuff just works. Uh, and in addition, we can also sort of synchronize data if that's what you want to do with sort of the other downstream systems so that then maybe you have other things um, that can action off of it that is also supported as well. Okay. Um, so let me, let me come back to, um, where we were talking about that customer engagement and journey, because that, if I if I understand, I, I think that's different from that data graph, which was the customer 360. That's correct. That's and correct. and um, would this be equivalent to something like the Twilio segment or or um, Snowplow, where you're trying to? It's almost like capture in in metadata and model um, the the activities that a customer would go through towards. Um, from from sort of engagement to conversion maybe help describe it to me because what i'm trying to understand is by doing the customer 360 um, data model you're able to do sort of low code no code tools that are con essentially configuration driven and i'm trying to understand this extension of the customer profile to the to the journey what that covers so that that's also you know, configuration. That's happens. right. That's right. So let, let me, maybe I, I'll go back to my earlier thing that I did, right? What does a customer journey do? Let's take any business in the world, any product that you sell, what do you need to do first? You need to first advertise around the product, right? And then you need to maybe do some campaigns to say, 
George, we have this awesome product that I need to sell to you, whatever the product may be, right? Yeah. Uh, or it could be a business too. It need not be a person. It could be a B2B or a B2C, right? In either case, you want some advertising, you want some marketing on it. And then when the leads get actually created, when you show some interest, then you want to be able to nurture the lead, right? Go through sort of the overall opportunity and then actually make the sale. Again, it could be an online sale or a, like a sales kind of uh, person involved sale. And then you want to be able to, once you've done the sale, you want to keep them happy through good servicing on top of it. And then you want to have all analytics on it to say what's selling, what's not selling and all of that kind of stuff, right? That's the bigger customer journey that every customer goes through in any business, whether it's finance, healthcare, uh, banking, whatever it is that you may want to sort of say, right? And what do you need? What is the missing ingredient in all of this? Is that single view of what the customer is actually doing with your business. You can now talk to any business. I mean, I've talked to like, I don't know, maybe 300, 400 different customers at all levels. This is a big challenge. Because why? Because data remains siloed. You have different applications, you have different warehouses. So half the business doesn't even know what their marketing teams have go put out and what are the customers asking them for or what have they purchased? How often do you see? In fact, I can uh, we can all relate to this. You go purchase something from one of the websites and then you still see the same ad tagging you all along for two weeks. And I'm like, I've already purchased the product. Why in the world are you wasting dollars on this ad, right? Because the simple thing is their own systems aren't connected. Their commerce system to their marketing is not connected. Or every time you call some, uh, uh, if you want to have some service uh, or a case or an issue, how often do you have to give them the whole life story to say, hey, what I have done? And like, and then God forbid, if you have to call again, you have to again repeat it half the time. And so what we have done with this customer 360 model is to be able to use that unified data from wherever your data can be, generate that insights on top of the data, but make this data, this unified data and insights accessible on all of this application surfaces. And in many cases, even push uh, actions so that you can go react to these things. Because if your LTV score changes or your propensity to buy changes, or maybe you're very unhappy with the product, maybe you need to be proactively reached out to, all of that stuff are changes, and we can also trigger. So that's really the bigger customer journey now we have unlocked. So now if somebody sends you an ad, you go to the website, it knows who you are. You call the salesperson, they know exactly what you're interested in. The website will say the same thing or your service person knows what you've purchased, what you're unhappy about so that they don't go try to go sell you something else. Or your analyst, data analysts also know exactly all of this information together and you're able to react to all of these things too. So it's not just some passive system sitting on the side, but it's actively telling you all that stuff. Now couple that with generative AI, we can take it to the next level because then we can even start doing a lot of self-service around these things. Uh, because think about it, if you want to have a self-service uh, bot agent that's helping you, that needs all the data, right? If you go to a chat thing and say, hey, help me this, if it doesn't have the right data, it's going to give you wrong answers. And we all saw what, for example, happened to recently a uh, airline company, right, um, in Canada, where the, gov the courts ruled that they are responsible for their what their bot agents actually do their AI agents do. And so more importantly, that data now needs to be much, much more accurate so that as you start using the power of generative AI, you want to make sure you're giving the right answers. And so that's really what we are enabling with our data platform, where we are elevating that data to a higher level to be able to create that unified model and then be able to go power a unified experience across your entire customer journey. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, perfect sense. What I what I'm curious to ask is, to what extent is that you know fully standardizable as a as a customer journey model, or where do you see customers dropping into um, some extens extensibility, whether it's you know DBT or or extending the data model, right. where um, where they you know where they they need to extend this this customer journey or even or even the the customer 360 data graph the data profile right right where's the edge of what you can standardize and and then yeah. how do people extend it great question so there are different levels of extensibility uh, one is at the model level obviously we we ship a bunch of canonical reference models like 
standard ones, right? Like customer, you need a customer first name, last name, address, those kind of things. But those are fully extensible. You can add your own fields to that model. You can create new models, create relationships between the models. All of those base primitives are extensible. That's one level of extensibility. The second level of extensibility is using those models, you can now start creating any sorts of insights, BI or AI insights on top of it. And that's kind of where the model extensibility comes in, where you can either use our models or your own models at all levels of the stack. Yeah. And then the third level of extensibility comes in the ability for you to bring your own sort of functions or your own triggers to be able to act on those, right? We can obviously make it work uh, out of the box with a lot of systems, but you may want to have your own sort of functions. Uh, you may want to have your uh, Google functions, Lambda expressions, or Azure functions work on it. That is also supported. So, so those are all the various sort of levels of extensibility we do at the schema level, at defining the relationships kind of level, uh, and then choosing what should be in the profile, right? That you can kind of choose what should my customer 360 profile would be. Even the unification, we allow you a lot of uh, flexibility because uh, many systems, for example, if they do unify, they may do once. Right? We obviously continuously do it, but we also allow you to create different unified graphs. Why is that interesting? Because remember, we are a multimodal system, meaning we are looking at your entire customer journey. A marketing team might decide that a 60% match may be okay if you're doing advertising, right? Whereas if you are servicing somebody or you're a bank or you're you want to do financial thing, you want probably highly deterministic match. And, and so we allow you to create different graphs as well, fully controllable by the customer, where you can create, I want a deterministic graph that I want to use. I want to maybe a more undeterministic graph I can use. Or you can even say, you know what? I want a unified profile because I want to look at what George, the person is doing. But I also may want a householding thing where anybody living in his address, I want to kind of create that unified thing so I know what your family is doing. You can do any of those things. All of that is supported as well. So we give you flexibility at almost all levels of the stack for you to be able to create that right experience for your business. And, and so all these extensibility kind of hooks don't break the low code, no code tooling that depends no. on that underlying metadata. That's so in, in other words, as long as it's done in metadata or or these models that can be um, sort of referenced That's you right. know, by their endpoints, um, then all these all these artifacts are are still visible to the low code tools. That is correct. Because why? Because every data we store has that Salesforce metadata attached to it. Right. So if, for example, maybe you say, you know what, I want to use Databricks to go create my ML model and do some predictive scoring. Great. Not a problem because we expose uh, to Databricks. You can go to Databricks notebooks. We have a great uh, JDBC out of the box Python connector. Use it, score the model. And then all you bring is the model endpoint to us. And then when we score the data, that's written back as a table with the metadata on top of it, which could be the LTB score. And so rest of the system doesn't even know or doesn't have to worry about you use Databricks, maybe use Vertex, or use our Einstein model, it doesn't matter at all. And right? so the ML ops for that artifact would be managed on the Databricks side. Like, is it drifting and do we need to retrain Exactly, it? you could do it that way, right? If okay. you use our Einstein, we give you all that thing out of the box. If yeah. you want to use your own ML ops, that's fine too, not a problem. But you don't okay. have to keep copying because otherwise people have to copy all the data, put somewhere else, score it, and then copy all this back in. Again, half the time that people do today is less about ML, it's only about data movement and data <laughs> kind yeah. of like engineering, right? So what we are doing is really unshackling that too, because we're making it so easy that you can actually focus on your business value. Um, we, we've seen that even for sales teams, service team, marketing teams, they spend more time moving data, figuring out that, as opposed to actually doing their core sort of business. And so we are really unlocking all of them to be able to focus on their core value and generate more value rather than worrying about just data movements and data security and copying and all of that kind of stuff. So, so let's, let's talk. We've, we've been mostly talking to, um, I think what, what most would assume would be the, the structured data, but you're, but you're really, you're, you're bridging from what I understand, all the different latencies, yep. um, the locality, like right. federating out to other data platforms and also the different data structures. Let's, let's, let's start with the, you know, unstructured data, how can you extract structured structure from it and integrate it into these um, 
both the, the customer 360 profile as well as the, the engagement yep. flow and, and what that looks like? Great question. Um, I think the world of databases, analytics, and pretty much all of CRM has been primarily structured, right? If you really step back and think all these years, like all of, let's take all of your sales or services based on somebody typing something into a form. But 80% of the world's data is stuck in unstructured forms. It, it's either conversations that you're having, emails, it's like Word documents, PDF, and so many so, so forth, and more and so even like video, audio, and many, many, many other forms. And most of that data has been sort of untapped, if you may. Yes, we have search to be able to search into them, but not really in your line of work. And so what we have now done is to be able to bring in unstructured and to really use that within your normal flow. So now with what we have done is you can now point to any of your unstructured data, be it in SharePoint, be it in some files in S3, Google, wherever it is, we can create what are called as vector indexes on top of them. So these are semantic indexes. They are not just textual indexes. They use the power of the LLM to understand the meaning and they're doing a um, multi-dimensional semantic a sort of a thing on which you can do vector calculations. This, what we have done is we've also made it like a table, these embeddings. So that means we can point back to the original object. So what does that unlock? It sounds all technical, but think about the things that it can unlock. I can now search for who, taught, who said something about a particular knowledge article. So if in my service case, I can say somebody is complaining about something. I can immediately look for what knowledge articles it might match. It may not even be in the same language. They may be asking a Japanese question, but I can quickly look up even an English reference because it's a semantic comparison, not a textual comparison. And then the second level is because we can now attach it back to the business objects, we can elevate it. You can now do analytical queries. I think uh, I showed you, for example, where I can now plot who's talking good or bad things about my product or about a particular thing and then I can link it back from a case to a contact and then plot it on a geography in Tableau, on a, on a map in Tableau, as an example, right? Uh, or I can start doing, interpreting all the emails that people are sending, look at their sentiments and be able to then craft a response email based on sort of what's going on with their business. The possibilities are endless. And to me, unstructured is the path where we can start also automating a lot because when I am talking to you, audio, video, that's like unstructured. And we can now extract structure. We can extract now semantics from it and then be able to use now the power of uh, AI to be able to even craft the right response back or even understand what I should be doing and automate a lot of these things. Like how often do salespeople spend time today uh, trying to figure out summarizing their whole conversations that happen in a meeting they spend a lot of minutes doing it. We are now already automating it with our sales cloud sort of Einstein thing integrated. That's from unstructured data. Service people, we are trying to now make it easy with your knowledge articles, but we're also making sure it's a platform, so which means you can bring in anything and you'll also be able to use it through any of your other existing tools that you may have uh, in your ecosystem as well. That so, is the power we're bringing in. Okay, so so let, let me, let me um, try and synthesize and, and see if I'm understanding how you can extend this. It's not just a way to extract structure to augment the existing structured data and structured flows, but could you um, essentially now encompass um, the, 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 the workflows around unstructured data that That's themselves right. are less structured? That's and those can, can how And what, what might those look like and how might you manage them? Oh, uh, very, I'll give you a very, very simple example. Let's take somebody is filing uh, an issue, right? A case. Let's say they're filing it maybe in Japanese as an example. And today what will happen is often that case will get filed. It will get routed to somebody, maybe a case agent or maybe a developer. And then they may look at it and say, you know what? I have the same case because somebody else filed something similar. You're going to look at it and go figure it out. Imagine if you had this simple now vector index and a flow automation on top of it. As I'm entering a new case, it can quickly look up saying, okay, is there anything that already came in the last half an hour, day, or whatever else it is, quickly match. Either don't even let you create the case and say there's already a case, go point to it. Or it could even escalate to say, you know what? A lot of cases are coming. 
it might be a serious incident. Let's now escalate it to your service agent right away, or you make it a sub zero, sub one, and so on. Very simple example. But it is not about structured data there. It's all about that unstructured you're typing, because I might type something some completely different than you're typing, but we can now semantically match it to say, this is the same problem. Let's do something. And you see how you can now dr drive structured workflows, or if you're using sort of co-pilots or other kind of AI thing, it could even be unstructured because I might be asking questions to say, you know, I'm having this problem. What should I even look for, right? At that stage, then you get more unstructured flows where it might look up knowledge articles and say, and then look up your other uh, thing that you may have previous cases or other things you may have created, combine the two and say, you know what, this is a solution to your problems. Maybe you should be doing this, right? So this unlocks all of that. Okay. Let's let's transition to this um, the the Gen AI and the co the Copilot builder um, because this is this is extending you potentially into these new less structured flows um, on right. less structured data where, where right. you have to extract the structure and then determine the structure sort of at runtime of how you want to manage that. Yep. Um, so maybe explain um, Copilot builder if I'm getting the terminology right like how it works, you know, what are the components, but then what are the building blocks you have to prepare in advance and then how it uses them? Great question. Um, so like we talked about, we cover the spectrum of AI automation analytics, right? Now let's focus on AI. We talked about predictive AI already. Now in the generative AI, what, what are the building blocks of generative AI? The building blocks of generative AI are data and actions. Right? When we say data, it's obviously data plus the metadata around it. So you want to make sure you're giving access to your co-pilot with all your data so you can ground it with your enterprise data. So it's not just some public data that the LLMs might know. It's really your enterprise data. The second thing is actions. And actions can be many things. It could be a flow, a workflow that you may have created. Or it could be an API that, say, accessible through MuleSoft or other means. Uh, it could be an external API, let's say, maybe a NetSuite API to go update your purchase order, or maybe it's some other uh, backend system API. Uh, or it might even be code that you write, like Apex code that you write in Salesforce, or maybe it's an AWS Lambda function, so on. All of these are the building blocks, data with metadata and the actions. And then that is what you give to a copilot. And we call that, with our copilot builder, you can create what are called as copilot actions. And in the copilot action, you basically just tell it, saying if it's an action, you kind of describe it, what that does. Maybe there's enough uh, description in the actions, or we can auto auto create the descriptions for you, or you can explicitly say, you know what, this API is really meant for a salesperson to be able to go, I don't know, create an order, as an example. Um, and then you can group these actions together to what we call as a topic to say. This is all about sales order processing. This is about service creation, or this is about uh, content, campaign management, or whatever it can be. And the co-pilot, then when you ask it a question, it can be an employee, it can be an end consumer asking the question, then it looks at your intent of your question. So if you say something like, um, what should I do today? That's an open-ended question. So then a lot of things come into play. First of all, what is the context? What is your role? Are you a salesperson? Are you a service person? Are you a marketing person? And that kind of intent, then it can translate to say, okay, based on that, it can look up all that data that you have access to, not all the data, right? The data that you have access to. And then it needs to go then go figure out what data it should go pull out, run some queries on it, or what insights it should be using, and then create what is called as a non-deterministic plan, if you may. First, figure out the intent figure out what data that you're maybe referencing to, uh, and then do the right queries, and then chain it with possible actions. Because you might say something like, you know what, go update the uh, latest opportunity for me, um, and then increase the order amount or something like that. And so that's a lot of interesting context in there. So based on your role, based on the context, maybe the page you're in, uh, and then the data you have access to, uh, and then the metadata relationships on that data to be able to then link all that together, saying, oh, order is related to contact, or this is related to uh, this, uh, and then be able to call the right APIs, which could be an update statement, or it could be an API call, say, through MuleSoft or other means. That is what the co-pilot does. Okay. Now, so, that's so, a lot of work, but yeah. all you have to do simply, simply you have to give us, okay, which actions you want to enable, 
What is the topic? What is the description? That's all you have to do as a end customer. So just just to just to distill, you're basically the the data and and the and its metadata gives you um, all the context. The the metadata is critical for linking all the related data, um, and then. The actions are the building blocks. So it could be the, the old Apex stuff. It could be an insight. Um, it could be a flow. It a can be a Mulesoft API. Okay. It can be a, a invocable action. And All of that is available. These are, the, these are essentially um, the collection of allowable actions. That's and right. then it determines, it builds a plan of how to use these. That's correct. It is, a like I said, non-deterministic plan, meaning it can automatically chain all this together. You're not telling what to do. It chains it. Now, in the Copilot Builder, we have a debugger too. You can, when you write a question, you can actually tell you these are the steps I'm doing. You can look at it and say, does it make sense or not? Now, if you don't think it's right, you can add more actions to it or remove some actions or change the descriptions. Uh, so you can fine tune it as well. Okay. The other important thing which we do, which not many systems do, is we also collect feedback. Because how do you know is your AI working? Right? It's not like you can't keep doing surveys. So what we do is as you're doing either co-pilots or any of our generative AI thing. There is a feedback thing right there. We collect that feedback back in our data system. And so then you can do interesting things saying, OK, how many salespeople really use my generative AI to create emails? Great. Like Now, maybe you, can, you need to go fine tune uh, model settings, or maybe you need to fine tune your prompts and everything else. That's one angle of it. But there's a bigger angle, which is the outer loop, which is how much of it actually led to an outcome, a positive outcome. Maybe it's like people opening emails, people closing sales orders, or like service cases, they're very happy about it. We have that outer loop too. Uh, and so you can now have both the inner and the outer loop to really know if your AI is actually working with all that data, metadata, and actions that you have. That's powerful because that's not just, you know, is my model drifting? It's to what extent is it impacting some customer related right. outcome? That's, that's okay. Right. So I, I know we're, we're, we're at the top of the hour. If you have a few more minutes, I want to. Um, if you have to go, we can we can stop and you know hopefully do this another time. We'll you know a part two. Uh, unfortunately, I have a customer call right now, okay. so I have to go. But uh, all right, then um, I guess one last question then is: you've simplified customer three hundred and sixty applications so that you know even non Salesforce customers should consider this um, as an intelligent data application platform, not just a data cloud, but a data That's platform. Good. That's good. Now. Does this mean that Salesforce is now selling the Salesforce operational apps plus data cloud as its extensibility platform um, so that you're not just an isolated data platform, but you are um, a comprehensive application right? platform. platform. And and you're, you're competing yeah. against other comprehensive application platforms, not just data platforms. Correct. We are trying to make sure we are our goal is not about competition or anything. We want to make sure our customers are able to make their customers' lives easier. Right? That's our goal. And that's why we are partnering with, like through the Zero Copy Alliance, we are partnering with a lot of these companies, whether you talk Microsoft, uh, Snowflake, Google, and everything else, so that we can make all that data available, insights available, and also share it back into those systems, into those systems back again, so they can customers can use it. So our definition is one of openness and partnership, so we can make jointly we can make our customers lives much better uh, but you're right spot on uh, what we are trying to really is to elevate the data we are really trying to really untrap all that trap data elevate it to the level of an intelligent actionable business platform so that you can actually use this data and insights across all these services okay uh mk hopefully we'll get to do a round two and thanks so much for joining today that was really enlightening Thank you, George. It was really great meeting you. Thank you all.